You're listening to the Yoga Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Tiffany Cruikshank. Our podcast brings you information and resources to enhance the therapeutic effects of your practice based on a deeper understanding of anatomy, physiology, and the integration of modern science and research with traditional practices and experiences. Join me and my co-hosts, Rachel Land and Katya Barch, as we dive into all things yoga, research, and wellness. All right, we're back. And this time we're here for some myths on pranayama, talking about some common things, some common misconceptions, I guess, around breathwork practices and pranayama and some helpful things to consider if you practice breathwork or pranayama, or if you're looking to practice it or using it with clients or students. um, I think helpful resource of some, some quick little tidbits of information um, to start with. Yeah. And we're excited to talk about this because we have a full length pranayama training that we love talking about. Katya and I both really appreciate and, um, enjoy breathwork practices and love teaching about them and sharing both the Western concepts of, uh, information and research applying to the breathwork practices, as well as these traditional practices and things that we don't really understand yet in regards to research and Western medicine analysis of information. Um, But a really great way to bring the two together in a way that helps inform therapeutic practices for better outcomes with your own practice and um, your students. And again, as always with yoga medicine, just finding ways to feel better in your life. So breathwork can be such a quick and efficient way to do that. I find it is such an easy way to kind of fit some really potent therapeutics into your day. I use it a lot with my clients, with my patients in our teacher trainings. We talk about it on some level and I think most of the teacher trainings, but definitely in that pranayama teacher training. And I personally use it a lot in my own life. So, and I know Katya does too. So yeah, and I'm I'm excited about the training, of course. I'm also excited about today's episode because breathwork and pranayama has gotten so much attention recently. And I think it's just interesting to talk a cup about a couple of the tidbits or about the things that have been out there and that yeah, are maybe misconceptions or maybe, you know, depends on how you phrase things sometimes. So really excited about um talking about these today. Right. And I think with that, it's it's really helpful to consider uh, the first myth, which is that breathwork is the new pranayama, this idea that breathwork is a modern adaptation or rebranding of pranayama techniques, but also that breathwork is something potentially maybe different than pranayama, you know, modern yeah. stuff like Wim Hof and all. <laughs> yeah, I think that's actually, um, there's actually some some misconception around that there's not a ton of clarity when using those terms sometimes. And um, I think it's really important to start off with that and to mention that breathwork is really just an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different breathing techniques um, that have very, very different roots or, or backgrounds. And it's generally, it means the deliberate control of the breath to positively impact health so emotional health mental health physical health and yeah just use deliberate practices to do that that's that can be anything that could be any technique where you work with your breath and there's various different origins of breath work so there are those more eastern traditions and pranayama and yoga or as one part of yoga would be part of that but there's also other Mm, yeah, maybe origins of breath work. We have some some techniques that develop more in the psychedelic communities or some techniques or styles that develop more in the Eastern European traditions. And it's it's all put together or it can all be grouped together under the term breath work. So it includes new techniques, old techniques. And actually we've done we've done a pretty extensive and nice um, episode on the podcast also number 85 that was a stroll through breathwork landscape where we go a bit more into depth with all these different traditions and roots of breathwork which I think to me at least um, I I find that very clarifying to to get an overview of that or kind of a conceptualization around that. 
Yeah. And just so people get an understanding of what that is, and you can definitely refer back to that episode for more details, but things like Tibetan Buddhism, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, Buteko, Wim Hof, you know, basically what we're saying is breath work is kind of a more general term and pranayama being a more specific lineage, ancient lineage, like many of those others are of breath work. And I think what's cool about looking at it more generally now is that we can kind of take the restrictions of each one of these more branded kind of lineage based based practices um, and take a more scientific perspective to it to find maybe adaptations or things within those systems that are maybe more relevant to our modern day lives or to our specific needs and um, finding ways to apply that. And I know, you know, even within yoga, we have so many different adaptations of that. When we talk about pranayama, it could be a seated practice. It could be used with asana you know, it could be used in you know, movement practices. So um, in each one of those, I think the pranayama lineage, to me, in my opinion, is one of the deepest, it's got the biggest breadth of practices compared to something like Buteko or Wim Hof, which have very specific practices, though they might have several. Um, there's such a large research re resource <laughs> within um the pranayama sector, we have a lot of different types and uses. And a lot of times we see overlap, right? Yeah, definitely. And and that's where it really it's really interesting to dive a bit deeper into the mechanisms behind the different techniques. And you will see that there is overlap between different, more maybe branded or specific techniques. But also you will see that as you're already mentioning, within pranayama, there are so many different techniques and and types of, of, of breathing styles, I want to say, that draw from so many different mechanisms and therefore can have a vast number of effects. And I find that also fascinating about yoga. When I started just practicing pranayama, I wasn't even as much aware of it, but now having done a really deep dive into that, it's just fascinating to me how many of the very different mechanisms and also effects pranayama holds. So it's really a huge and broad resource. And then, of course, like you said, we can also draw from some of the other ones and and kind of cater or, or tailor our breathwork practice. And probably some we don't really know yet. I mean, there's only so much. There's a pretty good breadth of research on on breath pra breathing practices, but probably still a lot we don't know. I mean, for instance, you look in a lot of the yoga traditional texts and you see a lot of benefits that maybe we don't understand yet from a Western med medicine perspective. And, and maybe some of those we change and refine over the years as we understand more about it. But there's also possibly this this leaving space for the mystery of what we don't understand. And maybe you never will understand, which is fine. If it, if it works, right. You, you sample it out. If it works, then, you know, I'm going to use it as a therapeutic tool probably. For sure. I like that mix as well. Just leaving a bit space for the mystery. But of course, I also appreciate that, especially the last, I'm going to say five years, a lot of more targeted and, and well done research on breath has come out. So I'm also appreciating that, of course, so we can draw from that as well. Which is so fun, because I know you and I both have, have um, shifted the work that we do as an effect of that and kind of adjusted the um, therapeutic uses, what we do personally and with our own clients. And so I think it's really interesting and important, especially as modern day practitioners, to keep modernizing what we do, but also, you know, respecting and, and learning from the tradition and, um, you know, what many years of practice have taught us from the tradition. Um, yeah. And so it's fun to have a little bit of both. I know you appreciate that as well. So the next one is a really good one too. This idea that the ultimate goal of pranayama is to fully control the breath or, you know, I think you could also say a lot of times in yoga is enlightenment. I think there's a lot less of that enlightenment publicity in the yoga world now, which isn't really, um, isn't really a goal of mine personally. I think enlightenment as a, uh, as it relates to me is just feeling good in my life, being able to do what I want to do, being able to perform how I want to perform, being able to have the cognitive faculties that I want, the energy that I want, showing up for the people that I want. Um, so maybe that's our modern day version of <laughs> enlightenment. But um, but yeah, having full control of the breath, I think, is an, is an interesting myth, the, the you know, ultimate goal to achieve that complete and constant control over one's breath at all times um, as being, you know, an interesting myth that floats around. 
Yeah, and I mean that sometimes comes with those anecdotal reports of of ancient yogis fully controlling their breath um, and holding it for very, very long times without dying. And I think it's safe to say, or at least it's my opinion, that's more anecdotal and not really scientifically substantiated. Um, so I would say luckily, and um, ultimately, our system, our nervous system, our physiology really has those boundaries to the breath control built in there. I mean, we can practice controlling our breath, for instance, holding our breath longer, and we can benefit from those effects tremendously. But I think there are those boundaries and a scenario maybe to go along with that when you're in the summer at the pool or in a lake and you die for for a bit at some point there is this urge that really comes um that you want to come up and come up for air and that urge of course at some point gets really really big anyone who has done a bit of diving will will yeah relate to that and i think that's a good thing but yeah as i said i don't think it's scientifically substantiated that someone can hold their breath forever basically um i find it fascinating that in our probably in our modern day the the discipline that does the best so holds the breath the longest as a proxy of controlling the breath are free divers so apnea divers and i i actually looked it up what the current world record is because that's constantly being being extended so currently and i think that's only a year or two old um the current breath hold world record according to guinness world records is 24 minutes and 37 seconds um which is crazy <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe is we crazy. have to add that is crazy we have to add that uh, guinness world records what they allow is that the diver um, breathes in pure oxygen before their attempt and that then of course will kind of um, delay the oxygen levels to drop and the carbon dioxide levels to rise which ultimately leads to that urge of breathing but but still I mean even if you breathe oxygen before 24 minutes is I, insane <laughs> that's a lot I would be like yeah. I would be happy to do a few minutes with ox with some oxygen. <laughs> I think that's a lot. Um, and I don't know about you, but for me, and I think for a lot of people, our goal isn't necessarily, I know some people get really excited about pranayama and get focused on how long can they hold their breath. And that can be an interesting pursuit. But I think for most of us, what's interesting about it is the effects that it creates in the body, the adaptations on our oxygen utilization in the system, the way that our body <laughs> is able to maybe breathe more efficiently too, not necessarily from breath holds, but from, you know, all the different practices that we can use in association with pranayama and maybe even myofascial release and yoga postures to help manipulate the mobility of the rib cage and the ribs and the diaphragm. And, um, so I don't know for me again, not, not so much as interesting how long I can hold the breath, but really the effects that come from the pranayama practice. So, I mean, I guess everyone's goal is unique to them. You know, for some people, their goal might be, again, I think this is probably the, the exception, not the rule. I think most of us are not in this bucket, but for some people it might be to hold their breath the longest, but for a lot of us is to feel our best. But there's this other caveat to it, which is part of the myth is that you know, to have complete and constant control of our breath at all times. <laughs> yeah, I, I I mean, I agree. And I think the control bit is probably just the one or the breath hold bit in that sense is probably the one where we notice, I'm going to put this in quotation marks, the restriction in our breath very intensely. Maybe that's why there is such a focus on on duration of breath holds when it comes to control, or maybe it's just an obvious one. But um I also personally in my own practice just love the nuances of it, like the the tiny things that shift and change and the softer technique, maybe how a little change in breath can already take effect and change my perception or uh, my energy level. And that's where it gets really interesting when you play with those little nuances and make it about the, the tiny changes without having to, you know, um, have a parade out there of, of breathwork effects. But yeah, I think the control is just the one where most people notice the, in quotation mark, restrictions 
most intensely or most obviously maybe? Well, and I think like like meditation, our goal is not to stop the mind from thinking. And in breath, it's not to control the breath constantly. We know for a lot of reasons how important it is to challenge our breath capacity, to get that aerobic exercise, to challenge those boundaries of our of our breath and our uh, aerobic system as well. And um, you know, maybe in the yoga practice, maybe outside of that. So this idea of having constant control of the breath isn't necessarily the point because even as those boundaries of, of our, our breath capacity and our aerobic capacity change, we still want to keep challenging that capacity to, um, really start to acquire those positive adaptations that come from that of oxygen utilization and, and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I think that having that goal of controlling it a lot like meditation is is a misconception of, you know, our goal isn't necessarily to to conquer it, but you know, like a lot of the yoga practice to appreciate the ebb and flow and the importance of our breath meeting the situation, rising to the occasion and then also coming back down a lot like our nervous system following the nervous system of course, right? To be able to rise to the equation and and come back down really smoothly, really easily. Um, and to really embrace all the different facets of the breath. And, you know, I think another reason why it's really great to have different types of pranayama to challenge the breath in different ways and, um, and breath work, you know, in pranayama specifically, we have so many different ways to do that. Um, breathing quicker, breath holds. We have different ways of valving the breath and different techniques, specific techniques beyond that. Um, and so I think challenging that capacity in different ways is important and not just getting fixated on conquering the breath so much. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next one is just another really good one is that this idea that you have to practice for long periods of time to see benefits, you know, that long sessions and, and potentially years of practice are necessary to gain the benefits. Um, I, I, again, similar, this one feels really similar to meditation for me. Um, in it being a common misconception as well. Yeah, and luckily, and that makes it also nice, just as kind of like entering breathwork land or starting to to do pranayama or breathwork, it has been shown that also just quite short bouts of breathwork have found to be effective. For instance, um, slow breathing, which is generally researched quite well or more extensively, that would be around like five breaths um, per minute six breaths per minute, um, five minutes of that have already shown to reduce stress and anxiety, heart rate um, variability effects have, have been seen. So increasing heart rate variability in that case. So just five minutes of practicing already can have an impact and, and just one bout of that. So not years of practice and not hours of practice, but just one short session. And even if we just take one cycle of breath, so one inhale and one exhale, you can even see that within that, there are certain effects that we can see that uh, reflect how the autonomic nervous system is up and down regulated. So your inhale is generally considered to be more up regulating and the exhale is considered to be more down regulating. And we can see that in a number of physiological um, yeah, markers. So even just Breathing consciously for a couple of single breath cycles already affect your nervous system, your autonomic nervous system. So I think that's also one aspect what makes pranayama really attractive. It's just like that one session at the desk or before a stressful situation or after a stressful situation in your day, just a couple of minutes can already have a really profound effect. And it's also one that you can throw in anywhere. You know, you, you don't have to do a headstand where you can use it in the office in in the bus when you're stressed out or in, in pretty much any situation, especially that slow, slow breathing. No one will even notice you doing it. <laughs> so it's uh, definitely a misconception that you have to practice forever and ever to see any effects. Yeah, I think it's it's the potency, it's the efficiency, it's the accessibility, I think that really make this such a such a valuable tool to have in our tool belt. We were actually talking about this just yesterday in the lymphatics training where we we're talking about glymphatics too and 
how uh, most of the time, so the lymphatics are the lymphatics of the brain. Um, most of the time it's cardiac driven, but as soon as we start engaging with a deeper breath, um, breathing more deeply, it becomes more respiratory driven, meaning that as I inhale, it pushes the cerebral spinal fluid up to the brain. And, and this happens naturally a little bit to some extent anyways, just with normal breathing. Um, and then on exhale, the CSF moves back down, down the spinal cord, down toward the lumbar spine. Um, also on inhale, I see this kind of vacuum like effect. So the negative pressure in the chest increases, which also acts like a kind of a vacuum or suction pulling venous blood as well as lymph um, back to the heart. And so pulling that, the lymphatics, uh, the glymphatics or the lymph fluid from the brain um, back as well, of course. So there's just like this flushing that happens um, for the glymphatics, for the brain, for the central nervous system, as we, that gets enhanced as we just start to breathe more deeply, especially with abdominal breathing as well, but um, just taking a deep breath. And so again, that can happen right away. It's not necessarily that it takes a long time. Of course, you can imagine a lot of these practices do have a buildup effect of some sort. I think too, like restorative and yin, I've found for myself with pranayama over the years that the more I engage with a practice, and, and really this happens more at the beginning, the more I get comfortable with a practice, the more quickly I can amplify those outcomes. Whatever I'm going for with breath work, we can upregulate, we can downregulate, we can do a lot of different things with it. But I can, um, for me, most of those pranayama techniques, I can amplify those outcomes um, just by being more comfortable with it, you know, like, like a yin practice or restorative, like there's a phase where you first start practicing where you're fidgety and you're uncomfortable and you're having trouble learning how to relax and get into the pose for most people. Um, the same is true often for pranayama. And maybe I even need to work on breathing mechanism or releasing some, some tissues to allow for better mobility. Uh, but eventually I get to a place where I can kind of be a little bit more efficient and get those effects a little quicker. So again, I do think, yes, it can be very simple. Take a deep breath. You want to calm down, just slow down your exhales. I think we've all experienced that. You know, you're going to do a, a presentation or something or teach a yoga class uh, and you take a deep breath and just slow down your exhale a couple of times. And we all kind of feel some of that effect. I use it in tennis a lot. Like when I'm competing, it's such a great way to regulate that nervous system um, response, which is so important in sports and athletics. But again, I do think there is a buildup as I've learned to use it in competition. It's become a better tool for me, even though we know that we can have some of that right away. So yes, great because it's really easy to get some of the benefits right away. I don't need a long time. It's efficient. It's effective. It's accessible. However, as I use it over time, I think those tools become more responsive more, um, a better resource right at my fingertips there as well. So some interesting points there. So, um, next one is, I think this one really applies more to yoga teachers. Um, but just this idea that we have to start every class with ujjayi breathing that, you know, deep breathing, ujjayi breathing, especially is a superior technique and should be practiced as a foundational technique, maybe at the beginning of every class, maybe throughout every class, but that, you know, ujjayi breathing is this kind of superior technique that should be used all the time in yoga. <laughs> Yeah, it's. I think it's one that's definitely out there, or that is a, a lift a misconception because just many yoga classes start out with it. I've actually thought about why that is. Like when compiling those misconceptions and myths, I thought why that is, and I was wondering if it's maybe because um, we know more about the deep breath, and of course it it can be down regulating. So that has. Um, of, of course, it has positive effects that we can use in a yoga class, beginning in a yoga class, using those deeper, slower breaths to just downregulate the nervous system and, and uh, decrease stress and so on. So, so it has a value, of course, but I wouldn't say it's superior per se. Um, well, and let me pause there and just say, keep in mind for people who aren't as familiar with Ujjayi breath, Ujjayi breath is that that what we call valving. So I'm trying to make the back of the throat smaller. And what it's doing is really slowing down the breath. And, and also, I think the second part of this question that I didn't put out there first is also, I think not just ujjayi breath, but that 
that deep breathing, as you're starting to talk to you already, just that that deep breathing is better and superior, that breathing deeply and fully um, can be a superior technique. And, and valving at the throat, this ujjayi breathing is a way to do that by slowing down the breath and exposing us to longer phases within the breath. So um, I can also change the outcomes. We know that inhale is more stimulating, more sympathetic versus more sympathetic dominant um, versus exhale is more parasympathetic, more calming. So we can, you know, just knowing that accentuate different parts of the breath using our ujjayi breath on the exhale is a way to kind of slow down that exhale and expose us to more of that calming parasympathetic state as well. So Again, that's just a little bit behind it. But again, back to this idea, the myth is really that ujjayi breath, so slowing down the breath, but also deep breath is maybe superior to other techniques. Sorry, just yeah. a quick little add-in. Yeah, thanks for the add-in. I'm going to add in one more thing even, um, because it's also been hypothesized that ujjayi breath through that valving and through the through the slow pace is also potentially kind of massaging the vagus nerve at the back of the throat. So even one more thing. So plenty of things that are beneficial, but the misconception or the point we're trying to make is, is there um, a superior technique? especially is deep, slow breathing superior to, to all the other breathing techniques. And I would argue it's not because we have just so many techniques that are being, we can use them for so many different um, applications or effects. So it really depends on what I want to do or what I want to achieve with the breath. And particularly if we want to contrast that with the deeper, slower breathing, um, there's also value in breathing less. So we could call that breathing less. So have less of a breathing volume, um, less of a ventilation volume. So either breathing not as slowly or not as deeply because that can um, increase your carbon dioxide tolerance. And that's a whole uh, theory behind that. We actually also had another podcast episode on that. I'm going to look at my sheet episode 87 it was the power of breathing less so um, we're not going to dive into all the details today because we have done so in another episode but breathing less so not slow and deep with this huge volume of breath can actually really have beneficial effects especially if you work under the assumption that generally in our modern life we may tend to hyperventilate to some degree so breathing um, quite quickly when we're under stress, for instance. So yeah, as mentioned, there's a whole theory, a whole physiology behind it. We look at it in that episode. And of course, we also look at it uh, in much more depth in the training. But long story short, there are also really good reasons for doing something very different than ujjayi breath. And Nevertheless, there are plenty of reasons why we could, of course, also use it at the beginning of class, but it's 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 not the only practice or only technique we should always use in any class, I would say. Yeah, and I think it's a, a really great when we again we talk about it more in that episode, but when we talk about hypoventilation or, or breathing less, moving less volume of air. Um I think it's important to mention that it's not a feel good practice. So in yoga, we're often drawn to those feel good practices, like the slow deep breathing, like the ujjayi breathing is a great way to, to help regulate the nervous system and a really important tool. And we also need practices sometimes to increase sympathetic tone. I think it's really important to remember that the, the nervous system needs to go through all the phases. Most people, it's harder for parasympathetic, but even the hypoventilation, which has really more effects, not as... Um, more effects on oxygen utilization. And the important part of that is that it is more of a long-term practice. So it doesn't give you the feel-good effect of the others. But as we understand, again, this is where what we were talking about before is like understanding the science and the research can help us get more out of these breathwork practices. We understand the effects over time. It makes it somewhat interesting to add into a practice. And I think what's great about it is that it can be um, I can use this idea of moving less volume in a lot of different practices. And it and like these others that we've talked about, really just takes a, a few minutes a day potentially over time to to see some changes. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's just important to remember that all of these are just different tools. One's not necessarily better than the other. Um, you know, we could add in too, you know, I think 
this is along that line of deep breathing, but even with deep breathing, something like belly breathing can be something I think that's really simple and oftentimes overlooked. It's actually my favorite way to start a yoga practice, especially my in-person classes. But, um, I think Ujjayi breath gets a, get, it gets like such a, like the spotlight so much in yoga practices, especially more active yoga practices, but something simple like belly breathing can be so important. And, you know, we talked about, I was talking about the lymphatic system recently, just a moment ago, belly breathing so far that we know the research suggests is the the best way to increase that lymphatic flow to help improve that, that rinsing action of the cerebral spinal fluid through the brain and the spinal cord. Um, and we know the thoracic duct, which is part of our lymphatic system, not the glymphatics so much, but the, um, return of the lymphatics throughout the body. Um, well, potentially a little bit, uh, uh, of that return from the, from the lower body, especially the thoracic duct is going to go through the diaphragm. So again, just belly breathing, having more movement of the diaphragm can be a great way to kind of massage that thoracic duct. So a great one for lymphatics circulation, cause that's enhancing that venous return as well. Venous blood, vagal tone. We know the vagus nerve goes through that diaphragm. So a really simple one, like belly breathing, I think can be overlooked when we prioritize Ujjayi breathing, which has less abdominal movement. Usually when we're Ujjayi breathing, we're moving through a flow and um, there's less of that movement of the belly, typically speaking. So yeah, I think when we focus on one breathing practice, it can be great to develop a relationship with it over time. However, we can kind of miss out on some of the other aspects of the breathwork practice. And I think at the same time though, as I say that, it's also... Um, important not to feel like you have to do all the breathwork practices to find the things that are helpful for you. And if that's Ujjayi, that's great. But I think hopefully at some point you'll find some other ones that <laughs> are also helpful. Um, all right. So one more, oh, oh no, we've got a couple more. One next one is breathwork involving hyperventilation is life-changing always. Uh, so this idea that um, hyperventilation like Wim Hof or uh, conscious connected breathing needs to evoke some kind of intense experience and alter, potentially altered states of consciousness, um, meaning you're doing it right if you have a big, big kind of experience, a big effect. Um, and I think this is maybe somewhat in the yoga realm, but now some of these more modern breathwork realms as well. For sure. And I think we're taking quite a big leap here because just now we're we're talking about deep and slow breathing and those more soothing or um, stress reducing elements or effects of breath work or pranayama. And we just go to a technique or, or a group of techniques that show that in fact, breath work is not always just relaxing and soothing, but it can also upregulate the nervous system. So we can, as you already mentioned, there's so many different aspects to it. So so now we're in a very different group of um, breath work and it is upregulating. And so sometimes actually it can feel quite life changing or quite intense because it generally has that upregulating effect. And also just from a research standpoint, I'm going to say there is a bit of truth to it in that it has been shown that those intense um, breathing techniques, conscious connected breathing, for instance, have created that kind of like mystical experience that we also associate with um, consuming psychedelics. So mushrooms, for instance, there are certain scales how you can measure that. And um, conscious connected breathing in a study has shown to also yeah, produce those mystical experiences and mood changes. So there can be quite profound effects. I'm also going to say that in the research, sometimes to, to look at those more intense techniques, the studies also choose to use really intense protocols. So some of those studies, for instance, on the Wim Hof technique are using more than two hours of voluntary hyperventilation. So that's quite a lot. If you've ever done that, that's intense. That's physically intense. And of course, then all the other effects you might notice um, can also be quite intense. So we also sometimes when we talk about these things have to keep in mind that what we're reading in the research and what's being communicated online sometimes is based on those really intense protocols as well. But of course, there's a nuance to this as well, I think, because those hyperventilation techniques We've mentioned Wim Hof, Conscious Connected, but of course also in the yoga realm, we have Kapalabhati or Bastrika. 
um, they have so many different effects. They can affect um, your breathing mechanics, your physiology, can upregulate the nervous system, can have an impact on the immune system. So various effects and also they can be impacted at various scales um, and also time scales. So some of the effects may even just appear after a minute of practicing and the degree of the effect may also be, you know, sometimes not as intense and there's nuance to, to that as well there. So I do think that just from personal experience, there is a lot of nuance to be explored. Sometimes that kind of takes people or, or takes people deeper into the practice or gets them excited because they have those life altering experiences. But also it, it can just be a lot softer and more nuanced. Um, maybe that ties in a little bit to what you said before. Um, the longer you practice, you you get to experience those nuances of the practice and, and benefit from those. So I think that holds true for those voluntary hyperventilation practices as well. And then maybe one one more one more aspect, also very sciencey. Then we don't know from the research that longer or more is really better. We we have more research now, but it's not at a stage where we can say, okay, this dose or intensity or length of a breathing practice will lead exactly to those and that um, effects. Um, so longer is better or shorter is better. We're just not there yet. So. From, from personal experience, but also from, from a scientific standpoint, we, ca we cannot really draw that conclusion as directly. Well, and I think it speaks to our human nature to want like this extreme intense experience to be able to like go in and like really do it well and get the most out of it. Um, instead of this slow drip, long-term experience of like, okay, I'm investing in a few minutes a day. I mean, I, I know it's, it's, probably everyone's human nature to just kind of, we get motivated to do something and we want it all. Um, but I think that nuance is so important and so interesting to training the nervous system. It's like, to me, when I, you're working on something like burnout, the difference between going on vacation, which has limited long-term effects on burnout versus instilling a, a regular protocol or routine that can be done, you know, just a little bit each day. Um, and I think the same is true with the breath work, you know, yes, the altered states can have significant impacts in other ways, but I think the way that pranayama can be in, in my opinion, <laughs> most influential in our long-term state of mind is in those kind of really slow drip experiences of finding ways to, to draw it into our routines. Even just, you know, those few minutes a day is such a big thing. So. Yeah. And it also, I think those more intense ones, they are also ones that maybe you want to practice with someone who's experienced and who's teaching that it's maybe not like doing those really intense um, practices for hours on end is not something you do in your living room on your couch. Maybe it's a good idea to be supervised or to practice that in a group because it is potent and, and things can can happen that are intense. So maybe that's that's one caveat there and and also regarding the potency of that practice maybe not to to be fearful or anything but just to to point to that potency is also for those hyperventilation techniques those are the ones where we're maybe a bit more cautious with some conditions like glaucoma or high blood pressure or epilepsy so there are there's definitely potency in those practices and they can be changing life changing and life altering so maybe maybe more more of an event character you could maybe even draw from them uh, so do that every every now and then when you're really consciously looking for that yeah and i think working with someone who has experience with that so they're really aware of contradictions and how to deal with things so yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> Definitely work with someone who has experience in that realm um, if you're going to go that route. So our last one, and I think this one's fairly succinct, fairly straightforward, but this idea, it is it is still a common myth that only advanced practitioners should do pranayama. And I feel like this one is more in like the more traditional yoga practices that we see this one show up that... Um, you know, you're, you have to be to a certain level in your practice. You know, the idea that the asanas are, are made to prepare you for, you know, the pranayama and prepare the nervous system to, to, um, to do pranayama, to, 
in quotes, do pranayama properly. Um, and you know, really that it's only suitable for advanced yogis and can be dangerous for beginners. And of course I, like we mentioned just now, I do think there's some truth in some of those really intensive practices that it, it can be dangerous for beginners or anyone unexperienced with these really intensive, exaggerated practices. Um, but the myth is really just that only advanced practitioners should do pranayama. Yeah, I don't even think we need to talk about this one too long <laughs> because we're clearly not of that opinion. But yeah, as you're saying, some some of the techniques are also just more technical or maybe not the ones that you go to at very first, but you, you use the ones that are accessible that create just a relationship and observation of your breath maybe to start with and you're not using the the fanciest techniques with with crazy protocols um generally you can do them but but it, there is a progression if you like and if you if you enjoy that as as kind of that keeping it interesting and and moving through a sustained practice adding in things altering things playing with variations there's for sure lots to play with but we're not shutting the door and 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 saying you 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 cannot come in you're you're not allowed, <laughs> but there is certainly a certain progression when you practice for longer times. Yeah. You know, I think, I think, yes, this is an obvious one. Of course we can do some of those simple practices and get a lot out of it very quickly. And I think it's a reminder of what we talked about is the effectiveness of very simple practices, slow, deep breathing, Ujjayi pranayama, belly breathing, you know, these things that a lot of us are familiar with. And even in the more traditional yoga text, the whole point of those warnings is that we should follow a progression, you know, just like the asanas. I'm not going to jump into handstand or jump into some really advanced posture without learning some of the foundational ones first, which I think is a good rule of thumb. And I'm assuming in that, you know, in these more psychedelic uh, breathing experiences that there's some of that in there as well. You know, this idea that like, we don't just start at the top, we kind of work our way to through practices to help regulate and prepare the nervous system to get there. But I don't need to be afraid of all of the practices, you know, I do, I think it's important to start early and, and maybe, maybe with people who never want to do asanas or aren't even interested in asanas. Like you said, it's a great one. You can do it at your desk. You can do it in your car. Well, some of there's some you might want to avoid in your car, like hyperventilation is probably a good one to avoid in your car. Um, you know, just in case, <laughs> but, um, you know, they're so useful in so many different ways because we can get so much out of them so quickly. And really this, the simple foundational breathwork practices that we see so much are a really great way to start, you know, some of Riti, even count breathing. So even inhale and exhale. So three counts in, three counts out or four counts in, four counts out, um, can be a really great one to start with. So yeah. yeah. And we don't need I'm to remedy actually on gonna... that one. Yeah, but um, now that you're mentioning also just three count in, three count out breath and just examining that or working with that, I'm going to add one more myth maybe, which is that there is this one magic pattern um, or rhythm of breathing, be it six in, six out, or five in, five out, or five uh, four in, hold seven, exhale eight or so. So there's also maybe one more myth that has to do with progression, maybe even, um, or generally also relates to those patterns. And um, I, I, I just want to add, there's probably also not the one correct, perfect, magical number when it comes to those patterns. But um, there are a couple of, of, of patterns that have been researched a bit more. For instance, um, six, six breaths per minute. So that would be five in, five out um, approximately. That's probably the one that has been researched the most, which has shown to um, be positive for heart rate um, variability, stress reduction, venous return, blood pressure. So many different positive effects relates to those slow breathing techniques that we've been mentioning. There's also others, uh, other patterns that have been researched, like that 478, which is anxiety reducing, for instance. But the beauty is really in, in exploring these, I think. And there's not that one magical rhythm. Just wanted to add that because I think that's another interesting um, myth or misconception. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I love that you added that in because I think it really comes back to that individual need <laughs> to be therapeutic. I need to meet the individual. So do I need, or time of day, you know, relationship to what I'm looking for in outcomes. You know, we've talked about a lot of different techniques, but also in the ratio, we've talked about different um, benefits of inhale versus exhale. So you can imagine that will influence the ratio, but even then the person Meaning like I've worked with really high level professional athletes who can't do more than a three count inhale and a three count exhale. And for them, that was a lot, you know, and you know, it does progress a little bit over time, but I'm not going to try and force them to do six counts or something because it's in quotes better. What's better for them from, from my perspective and my opinion, what's, what's better for the individual is something they can do and still capture a, a sense of some sense of ease. I am trying to challenge the system to a degree and in some practices more than others. So I will maybe push that capacity some, but, um, I do want a sense of ease in most of these pranayama practices so that I'm not gripping and guarding and straining and exaggerating, you know, some of those accessory breathing muscles, um, but really instilling that sense of ease to optimize breathing mechanics as well, usually. So, you know, finding that ratio that suits the individual is so key. And then knowing what my goals are, do I, am I working with anxiety? That four, seven, eight is a great one can be really simple to just to prolong exhale. Am I trying to prepare for a competition and incre increase sympathetic tone potentially, you know, or train the nervous system to go back and forth. There's a lot of different reasons and ways that we can use these practices, which is why we love diving into all this information in the pranayama teacher training. We have to talk about all the details and research and applications and, you know, modifications and therapeutics of this, um, because there just is so much to it. And for me, again, if you're like me and I think Katya, Katya too, we're both on the same page on this one, I think, but, um, you know, for us, it's really about feeling the best in our lives, performing the best, whether that be in sports and work and, you know, our families and our interactions and in our life being present, um, um, and, and also feeling good in our bodies. I think, you know, what we're looking at is really what we're talking about are these therapeutic outcomes. And again, I need to know what my goals are. I need to adapt it to suit my individual breath capacity. And so, we talk about that and a whole lot more and contraindications and all the things and breathing mechanics. I don't know what else. <laughs> Physiology, nervous system, anatomy. We totally left out anatomy. Uh, so really, and, and the traditional aspects of it as well. So I think if you dive or when you dive into all of those different topics, it becomes a lot more clear what you want to do or what you want to achieve with your pranayama practice and which of the different tools available might be the best fit in that scenario. So I think it's one that can be tailored so well once you get a hold of those different mechanisms and aspects of it. And that's why I love I love what we've what we've put together. Uh, I also love the podcast, just looking at those different misconceptions, <laughs> but I just also love really understanding what the different techniques do on many different levels. And yeah, that's what we're doing. And I think what's what's really unique about it is taking both an Eastern and Western lens to it. So again, like I mentioned before, looking at, we do have an abundance of research. It's, it's still limited. Of course, there's always more research to be done, but we do have an abundance of research now on pranayama, um, taking a Western lens to the anatomy and physiology of the breath, but also looking at the traditions and the traditional practices and, and what that might mean to us and how we might use that therapeutically, as well as looking at both the Eastern practices and the Western practices. So we do talk about um, some of these newer, in quotes, breathwork practices, as well as some other lineages as well. Um, mainly, we're going to focus on the breadth and depth of pranayama, because that's what we do and use so much, but also mentioning some of the other um, more modern practices that you see out there in the world, um, and how they might integrate within a yoga setting or not, um, and any ther you know potential therapeutic uses there. So a really fun one if you're interested in it. Otherwise, we've always got more free resources on our podcast. Um, anything else you want to add, Katya? Mm -mm. No. Looking forward to everyone who's joining us, but also, as you said, plenty of other resources that you can, for instance, check out on the podcast. So have fun with it. 
yeah. Thanks for joining us. I look forward to the next one. I hope you got some good insights out of this one. Bye. <laughs>